Blog Talk Radio. Archangels, Ghosts, and Bigfoot, oh my. It's just another night for Supernatural Girls. Real stories, real answers to life's biggest supernatural mysteries. And now, for another exciting interview with paranormal experts from this world and others. Here's your host, paranormal researcher Patricia Baker, on the one, the only, Supernatural Girls. Welcome, everyone, to another exciting episode of Supernatural Girls Radio. I am your host, Patricia Baker. I am here with my co-host, Patricia Kirkman, PK. How are you tonight? I'm very well, thank you kindly for asking. It's a lovely day. At least we have sunshine this afternoon. Well, praise God. That's I'm telling you what. in the right direction. <laughs> I know. You've been freezing out there in Tucson, which is unusual. Oh. We've yeah. been freezing here in New England, which is not unusual, but we're tired of it. So mm-hmm. it is what it is, as my friend says. So we have to deal. We just have to deal. But we've got a great show tonight because we have one of our very favorite guests, Laura tempest Backrop, is joining us tonight. She's got a great new book, yeah. and we are going to find out all about what's going on with a modern witch tonight. But first, what's going on with the numbers? And I hear about Mercury retrograde coming back. So well, let's hear let about me put it. it this way. There, everybody I have been talking to, and I should I say everybody, and I'm not kidding, it's either something is not working right, something needs to be changed or whatever. Well, we forget that when Mercury goes retrograde, this time it'll be the 5th of March, but we have a two-week shadow period before it hits us. And sometimes the shadow period is equally as bad, if not worse than. And the reason I'm saying that, for those that were born in a retrograde, lucky you, because during a retrograde, that's your luck time. So you can just break all the rules you want to. It seems to work very well for those. Everybody else is going to take it in the backside, if you know what I mean. Oh, no. <laughs> and well, think about it. And what makes it worse, I think it's worse. But it's retrograde is in Pisces. So illusions, delusions, and the other side, it's kind of like, hold on to the seat of your pants, folks, because it's going to be a heck of a ride. That's why I just thought I'd mention it. And I think when we're wow. watching the things wow. going on in our governmental element and these uh, little group talks that they're having in Washington, I think the retrograde's going to get them big time. So keep watching, folks. It's going to be interesting. Yeah, I mean, you and I were talking about this earlier, and it seems to me like a lot of the masks are coming down around people who have been uh, talking all kinds of crazy stuff. Uh, I I don't even want to get into it because it's so ridiculous, but some of the things they're proposing are perverted and insane. It's just weird, you know. It's like, what are you talking about? But the, the masks are coming off. You you you, you mm-hmm. predicted, and you also saw the Smollett thing that was going to fall down around him because you knew it wasn't real and you did tell me that you didn't want to say it on the air which I don't blame you because it gets so volatile but at the same time you knew that this person was not telling the truth and certainly that came out now there's going to be more I think so it'll be oh, interesting to not see. Doubt in my mind. within two months <laughs> time we're all going to be going what in the world and how did that get here yeah I so bet oh goodness me well yeah, I mean, we're still waiting for more and more disclosure, but I do see there's still soft disclosure going on with UFOs, more and more photographs, videos, and things like that. We have some on our Facebook page. We have right. three UFOs flying by the uh, the moon, and actually it was caught on by NASA. So that's on the mm-hmm. Facebook page. Everybody go take a look at that. It's pretty cool. Right. We have all kinds of cool stories, all kinds of cool stories. On the if Facebook people page, forget so to check, take a look. To check the, that page, really, even if you don't get a chance to check it today, look at it throughout the, the week because we've got so many different things that are there and have been there for a while that you may have missed. So go back and check it out. 
Oh, yeah. Because we always try to stay current. We, we post all the interesting <laughs> stories we can find. We're always happy to do that. Because it is a paranormal world for us. That's where we like to be. Oh, so we like to share those stories with everybody. It's, it's just so much fun. And, of course, if you want your own numerology reading, you know where to go, patriciakirkman.com. And also, PK can be found on the Supernatural Girls website. That's Supernatural Girls with a Z. And you can contact PK and set up your own private session. And PK also does classes. So don't hesitate to reach out. And I'm still doing and just having so much fun with the soul realignment work. Very powerful. Oh, yeah. Just another tool in my... I love it. Mm -hmm. I'm really enjoying it. And people are are able to look at themselves in a very unique way with this work. So it goes deep, but it's fun to do, and it releases a lot of things that are in your way. So don't hesitate to reach out to me. You can find me at SupernaturalGirls.com. Shoot me an email, and we can set up a time to talk. So now, let's see. We have got a couple of wild stories here on paranormal news yeah. tonight. <laughs> oh that my we do. <laughs> now there is a show or there was a show I should I should say called Dark Skies. Now I didn't remember mm-hmm. the show, but my husband did. And he said, Yeah, I remember that show. Well they were talking about this today on Mysterious Universe. And the most interesting part of the article, and it's all on the Facebook page, the -hmm. producers talked about this guy that just showed up on their set, and he was nicely dressed and young, but nobody recognized him. And he approached the producers and said, we've seen your pilot. But they found that strange because at that point, the pilot hadn't aired yet. So they're thinking... How in the world did this guy see it? So Uh the man said, again, uh, we've seen your pilot, and we think you got a lot right, but we want to help you with the rest. So the mystery man suggests to the producers that their show could benefit from inside information on UFOs and that he would provide them with this information. So anyways, they, they just couldn't believe what was happening. But they kept asking him, who are you? And he wouldn't really answer. He just said, that's not really important, but I work with people who have an interest in what you're doing and what you're putting out. So then, now this is the part that really I found kind of shocking. Mm -hmm. Grabs a napkin, all right, and he scrawls something on it. And the producer said it was a bunch of symbols and stuff. And the man hands the napkin to the producer who asks him, what does this mean? And the man says, these are the secrets of the universe, sound, light, and frequency. So, of course, everybody wants to know, where is the napkin today? And unfortunately, the producer says, I haven't seen it in years. Uh, One of the other producers has it locked in a safe someplace. Well, we'd all like to see it. So anyways, take a look at this this article and the adventures that happened with this show. It is quite, quite amazing. Now, we also have another story in your neck of the woods. Yeah. That is ghosts. What did you think of that? I was amazed. And not only amazed with that, but amazed at the fact that we had camels (laughs) that had been used in the 1850s. Yeah. Who who would have thought? Well... This is a very strange case, and they call it the Red Ghost of Arizona. And I think it is somehow linked to to um, Geronimo, because yeah, they talk that's about what they Geronimo. Say. Yeah, and mm-hmm. that his he and his warriors were kind of pissed off because of what had been happening to their people, so they left a path of destruction. But you know, Geronimo, he was a very powerful shaman. He knew very how to much. use portals. Remember, he would go from port mm-hmm. from place to place, and they couldn't figure out how he would go from point A to point B, which was like all of a sudden, the blink of an eye, he would be 50 miles away. And it, of I course, know that amazing. How, yeah, so well, this is how he did it, I think, through portals. Yeah. But when you open a portal, doesn't mean it's going to close behind you. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. 
and anything can come through. So my guess is this very bizarre red ghost of Arizona, which was very dangerous, by the way. Um, oh, this yeah, thing nasty killed little guy. Yeah, it killed people. Yeah. Um, I think it might have been something that came through when the portal was open. That's a possibility. So, mm-hmm. Yeah, it's my guess. Anyways, who knows? But it's a very interesting story. You will see that also on the Supernatural Girls Facebook page. Make sure to follow us on Twitter also. We have Haley tonight who's helping us out once again with tweets. So make sure you, you are following us on Twitter. Okay. So now on to the best part of our show. Tonight, yes, I can't wait. <laughs> I know we love Laura. We have Laura Tempest Backrov with us tonight, and she's talking about modern traditional witchcraft and how it's a path of self-discovery through experience. So how do you combine a traditional path with a contemporary life? She's here to show us how it's done. Now, Laura is a professional artist, a great author, and also a modern traditional witch. She's the author of a number of books, including The Witch's Cauldron, Sigil Whistery, and her new book, which is called Weave the Liminal, Living Modern Traditional Witchcraft. So, Laura, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me back. It's great to be here. Ah, we, we love, love having you on. So, absolutely. Now, <clears throat> your book is great, and as I said to you prior to us going live, I love reading your books because I get lost in your books. You really draw me in, and I know that's what you do mm-hmm. with the entire reading audience. So, you are a great writer, and you talk in the book, and I was so interested in the way that your whole path kind of unfolded, and you described it. In a, in a very right brain way, which I thought was cool. So share that, if you could, some of that with our audience of how you came to this path of being a witch. Uh, it has been a pretty much quarter century of a journey now at this point. Um, and you know, essentially coming into this, you know, coming from a um, basic traditional Abrahamic background, uh, but actually like it's not so traditional because my, my mother is a, is a um Sicilian, Italian, Catholic, and my father is a Russian Reformed Jew. <laughs> so, oh, wow. Good combination. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, oh, yeah, traditional. No, no, wait, it's not. <laughs> it's just how things were for me. And uh, so, had, we're actually a bit of an unconventional uh, approach to things. You know, I went to Catholic school, and uh, pretty much right off the bat, I think it was in first grade, it was sixth. We went to a field trip to the church as it was attached. And uh, at some point, you know, they were talking about the altar and where things are done. And I decided I should be able to sidle right up there to the altar because I'd seen my brothers who were both altar boys up there, uh, you know, doing things. And they're like, well, no, girls can be up there. You know, this is, again, going back quite a while now. Now they're girl acolytes, right? And right. uh and I just remember being at six, very, very upset by this. I'm like, well, I can't because I'm a girl that I couldn't be a priest, that I couldn't be up here on the altar. Uh, I got sent to the principal's office. And uh, that really kind of launched a, um, a a journey of, you know, really questioning what I was being presented with. I mean, it sounds silly at six, but you know, I I just knew that there was something else in how things were supposed to be. And now I'm recently reflecting on, you know, being someone who uh, helps guide other people on their path, regardless of you know gender, of sexuality, and for helping them to discover themselves, they're looking at their background and their modern life and how to make an effective practice for themselves. You know, so first it was finding it for me, and then finding a way to help other people do the same. Well, you have a, a great path mapped out in the book. And, but one of the things you talk about, and I'm very interested in this because I see this in lots of different groups, whether it be Bigfoot, the Bigfoot groups, or the UFO groups, there is a, sometimes a, a bit of nastiness, competition, or whatever you want to call it. My group's better than yours, or I know the truth, you don't. Do you see that also? Yes, that's what I call the authenticity wars, and I don't think it's quite, well, there's always new forms of it. I think every decade brings another 
another layer to it. But uh, back in the 90s, you know, it was like, oh, well, what is authentic? And you can't be an authentic witch unless your practice is, you know, you're Scottish, so you're here, or your Italian witch card, you're from this path, or this path is the oldest path, so it's the best path. It's like, not really. I mean, especially if you're those of us living in the United States who are the result of many different cultures merging together, you can't go back to some country and say, well, these are my roots. So like, they're a part of your roots. Um, and I think also when it comes to these people arguing about what is authentic or who's more right, it's about insecurity. Uh, you know, and so not knowing exactly where you come from um, and also trying a whole new system, like, all, you know, all of these spiritual paths and new age thinking and um, paranormal concepts, metaphysical ideas, we're not working from you know, a book, right? We come from, again, the Abrahamic background where you're like, here's the Bible. It says all the answers. You know, everything is in here. You know, what you're supposed to do, what you're not supposed to do, supposedly, right? Uh, and yeah. when you come into witchcraft or Druidry or any of these other spiritual paths and say, it's really up to you to decide what's going on here. It's up to you to consider your morals and your ethics and what is right in your practice. People feel a little uncomfortable because we have a society that has taught us not to trust ourselves, uh, that our intuition is just, oh, that's just a crazy thing. You know, that's just a lot old wives tale. Like, no, we have a sense of being connected to the world. And just because modern life in some ways has disconnected it from us, uh, doesn't mean it doesn't work. Uh, and so, I mm-hmm. think that's where it's really pe- people wanting to feel like they're powerful over other people and trying to fight their own insecurities is why there's so much infighting when it really doesn't matter. Yeah, it shouldn't because it's all a, a, a journey to find yourself at the end of the day. Exactly. So so when um, with your approach, I mean, it sounds like it's a very – kind approach, a very loving approach, that there is also a lot of room for people to do all kinds of self-exploration without judgment, to find their mm-hmm. own path. And that's what I took from all of your work, but also specifically this book. What made you want to write this book, Weave the Liminal? I'd say that this is the book I wish I had when I was first starting out, Uh the you know I've I've been recommending for years drawing down the moon by Margot Adler, which is a good exploration about modern uh, neo paganism, especially within the United States, and Doreen Valiente's Witchcraft for Tomorrow, which is a, a fantastic exploration of witchcraft and defining your own path. But Doreen's book was written in 1978, so it's it's you know it is now over 40 years old. It is a bit outdated in some of the ways of you know how to relate to things, and a lot has changed and how we view witchcraft. Um, the same thing with Drawing Down the Moon. It really hasn't been updated since 2000. So there's uh, 2005 or six. I think, was this last minor update. And a long time. Yes, yeah. it's been, it's like been flying by. Like It felt like, wasn't that just yesterday? <laughs> oh, my God, it's you know, 2019. <laughs> how did we get here? That's and, right. Yeah. Oh, my God. Surprise! <laughs> <laughs> and so... And when I when I was really formulating my path, you know, in my mid twenties, I was trying to put these things down into a book, and I started writing this book. And uh, <laughs> kind of funny, the universe decided that wasn't a good time because it suffered a uh, major hard drive failure, which also fried my motherboard, and it just wiped out the entire book. And, oh um, no! Yeah. Oh, then I started, I tried it again, and I think it was another hard drive failure. I'm like, okay, I'm going to take a sign from the universe. And, and now, now I'm very thankful because I've had so much more lived life experience and I've come to a better perspective on my path and also in teaching and working with other people. So I'm really glad that book never happened <laughs> back then. <laughs> uh, and this is what I can offer people now. And who knows what I'll say, you know, in another 20 years, but... I think I, I'm fairly much at peace at where this is. So this is this is sort of my my gift to new practitioners, and also for a lot of folks who have been really surprised is the people who have been practicing for 10, 20, 30 years have been picking up this book and said this has renewed my path and my interest and put me back on where I want it to be. And I'm like, wow, that's amazing that from you know these newbie little you know baby witches or witchlets to folks who've been doing it a long time. 
that they are finding that compass that they needed or they didn't even know that they needed uh, to reorient themselves with their past. Well, that's great because you are bringing together the traditional world and the modern world, and I would imagine that it could be a little daunting for people. So how did you bring it together? So the, um, I think it would be good to, to talk about the system that I have, which is called RITES, uh, and that is R-I-T-E-S, and it starts with R is roots, and that is where you're coming from, what makes you up, and I, I tell people to start with not looking for a book on paganism that's like whatever culture, you know, blah, blah, plus, you know, witchcraft. I think go to, you know, not only your roots, like where you think your family has come from, um, but also where you're living and look at the folklore of the region, uh, whether that is Italy or Russia or South America or the Caribbean or New Jersey. And all of these areas have folklore that has been recorded for hundreds to possibly even thousands of years, depending on how, how old the civilization is. And when you look at the folklore and you look at the mythology, you're able to see the wisdom that has been passed from generation to generation. Myths aren't, you know, do this exactly how it sounds. They are a way for the human psyche to grasp onto stories, morals, ethics, and protocols of dealing with ourselves, each other, God spirits, the dead, the fae, you know, all of these little secrets are woven into myth, and that's part of tradition. But tradition also isn't what's old. Tradition is something that we're creating every single day. So you might have a family tradition that you just started, you know, a year or two ago, and it might be going down now six generations down the line. You know, we're always innovating and revisiting things, because it's what works for that time. That's what tradition is. It's the way to hold on and pass on ideas, but also to create a way of magical and effective living. Well, and you talk about that in terms of food, which is very interesting. So you talked mm-hmm. about, I believe it was your, uh, your ex-mother-in-law who taught your husband, your ex-husband, how to make a particular dish and how that was a part of their tradition. And it's it's so true, especially, well, the Italians, my God, you know, food is such a major <laughs> part of life. You know, it is life. So there, there's a great place to understand where traditions come from and how they get passed on. And yes, I did get hungry when I read that part in your book. Because <laughs> <laughs> yes. all those things you talked about sounded very delicious. Mm-hmm. No, but that but that's a good place to understand what tradition is and then how you have to adjust it for modern times. So there's benefits for both and there's benefits to being in this world today where we have so much access to knowledge uh, through the Internet and so much access to connection through the Internet. So we're able to do a lot more that way than we could before. But I'm sure there are groups and which uh, witches who – Maybe shun that. I don't know. Is that a place where sometimes people do not, witches do not want to get involved in that part of uh, modern world with their traditions and want to keep it separate? Uh, I think there are some, but witches are known for being very practical. <laughs> you know, it's like uh, <laughs> I want to be the MacGyver approach, right? It's to take what you have around you and make it work. And we've been doing that for thousands of years. Uh, whether you use the word witch or not. Uh, so I think there are some traditions where this is the way it was done for, you know, 40, 50 years, and this is the way we continue to do it. Um, but I think it's always good to learn that. I think most of the, the traditions I've experienced where they're passing along lore and say this is how it's done, they're doing that to say this to learn this method and the seasoning behind it, right? I guess going back to food, like what are the flavors involved and how do you get here? Uh, And then once you've learned how to do it, you know, once you've gotten to the level where you understand the material, then they say, oh, by the way, but you can also, you know, add your own seasoning or change things up. You know, now that you know how to do it. And so I think some people just, you know, barely get into understanding how, 
a family, a, a tradition, a certain uh, system of witchcraft might work, and like, oh, oh, they're so closed-minded because they, you know, in the first year of study, I could only do this. And it's like, well, if you just stuck around, perhaps you would have known that, you know, three, five years down the line, there's so much more. But again, when you're learning something new, you, you don't hand somebody a sharp blade right away, right? You're like, okay, well, if you if you want to help prepare the dinner, you're going to wash the carrots first before I give you the, the peeler, you know, or so they don't right. clog the sink, you know. All these, there's different kinds of protocols, and the same is true with witchcraft. So that making sure that people are are safe, that they're sane, that they're understanding how things work. And so I think that most witches, all you know, when if you you put them to the test and ask about tradition and modern living, they're going to say it's a bit of both. So, well, that's good. That that's makes really sense. Because somebody asked me a couple of weeks ago if I was a witch, and I said no because I think it's too much work. I and I'm serious <laughs> because <laughs> you got to learn this stuff. You know, it's like it's, and and even but I do see that there's ways like you're mentioning and you're talking about. Once you master the concepts, once you understand the workings of the natural world, then it becomes easier. And there are are different kinds of witchcraft where you can use what's handy in your kitchen. You don't have to order exotic things that aren't local. So, you know, I can understand how it it can be more streamlined today. Yes. And that's nice. I like that. It makes a big difference, I think. And and I think that's really where it comes down to making it authentic is having the freedom and understanding that you know how it works, but you know that you have the freedom to change it. Uh, And because it is the authentic practice that works for you. And in the end, that's the only person you really need to worry about is, does it work for you? And I guess does it work for your group? (laughs) Right, right. (laughs) Well, now, and, and when you were growing up, I thought it was interesting that your family referred to you as the pagan. <laughs> now, was that done in a lighthearted way? Was it kind of a family joke, or how did they handle that with you? Uh, I guess it depends on the day and what I was being, what I was being called. Um, so, uh, you know, I didn't, I, I definitely didn't like going to church after, especially after first grade. Uh, <laughs> because you know, I found you know I found it boring and you know like this is not you know why is God only in the space and uh, you know so I just I was sort of a pill um, <laughs> so I gave my mom a hard time and you know and I would go and visit my grandparents now I, I think I gave my grandparents a little less trouble because they were actually part of the first Italian Catholic Church in Philadelphia which wow uh, they have two churches in the same spot. Um, one up, up, upstairs church that is amazing with all these uh, stained glass windows and every surface is painted and covered in murals and these amazing saint statues. And then the, the lower lesser church is all tiled and mosaic. And it's like they're, they didn't, you know, they're like, oh, it's it's just smaller, but we're still going to make it pretty. And so it had so many different things to look at. And, you know, if I was really bored, I could always just go through the rosary and look at the beads. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but you know, I, I would oh, still have funny. ideas where I would say, you know, say things about, you know, well, I don't think that's true, and so you know, we get the host, oh, a little heathen, and a little pagan, while you know, she doesn't want to go to church again, and uh, oh, boy. so and, you know, I don't think they meant to be mean, but uh, <laughs> but you were brave. Mean. I mean, you were very brave to speak up like that. And then, as I read further into your story. In the book, you also talked about being in a marriage for a long time, and it wasn't working, but you ended up walking away from it. That takes a lot of guts, and you moved across the country and started your life in a different way. I mean, that's, you're very courageous. Oh, I, I think it just comes from a <laughs> sense of, uh, yeah. I have a you sound startled that you are. It's to work out right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, you just, and I think it's that you're an inspiration to a lot of women who want to explore a new path. And this is another mm-hmm. reason why I recommend your book to, to, especially women, to read. So anybody who feels stuck in a particular life or lifestyle, uh, there are options. 
<clears throat> and certainly you were not afraid to take on those choices and make different choices as the crossroads appeared to you. So it, it's a great read in terms of how you did things in your life. And you also started some magical circles in, in college when you were at the Rhode Island School of Design. Yes. <laughs> that sounded uh, yeah, like fun. It, it really was a lot of fun because, uh, you know, it's like, okay, I'm here. And, you know, I had met another witch, and then she moved back to California, and I'm like, well, now I feel like I'm here by myself, but there's got to be more witches around here. There's got to be more pagans. And so I I went to the Office of Student Life. I'm like, I want to start a pagan society. You've got a Jewish society, and you have a Christian society, and you have this. And they're like, yeah, sure, go ahead. <laughs> That's and, amazing. Uh, and <laughs> so I did, and people started showing up, and, and then it kept expanding because we really were the only pagan society in, in Providence. Uh, college age, you know, first it was other colleges, college kids who wanted to join, and then there were people like, well, not in college, but I really want to join, and it just kept expanding to a larger and larger group. And, uh, you know, it wasn't really, I didn't set out to create a large group. I just wanted to find other pagans and witches and mm-hmm. witchy folk to get together and do the thing. And I think that's, it's one of those, uh, you know, I have to say, I really love the movie Field of Dreams. <laughs> I know it's based on a book, uh-huh. but I've watched uh-huh. this thing so many times since I was little, and it, it really does. If you build it, they will come. And I, I firmly believe that, like, no matter where you are, I see people going, oh, there's no pagans in my area. There are pagans. There are witches. There are metaphysical folk everywhere. I've been all over this country, from Alabama, uh, all the depths of Missouri, and, you know, all the way through New England and weird parts of Washington. There are witches and pagans everywhere, and if you create, if you just put it off out there to create an opening, you will find there are more. Now, what you get after that, no guarantee. <laughs> but they will come. <laughs> oh, but that's comforting. It's nice to know that people can find other people of like minds in uh, in witchcraft and working with witchcraft, so again, they don't have to be alone in it. And you found that out in college, which is great. Well, we're going to take a very short commercial break, and we're going to come back, and I want to talk to you about spellcraft also because you, you go into that in depth in your book. So mm-hmm. stay tuned, everybody. We're going to take a break, and we will be right back. Pure essential oils, specialized minerals, and a revolutionary anti-aging technology. Astridian combines the best of all scientifically proven ingredients in easy-to-use creams, lotions, and concentrated serums. Astridian's advanced line of products take your skin to a new level of being healthy and beautiful. We offer a variety of collections that address all your skin concerns. The Essential Anti-Aging Series treats and moisturizes your skin for a long-lasting, younger look. The Multivitamin Series promotes healthy skin with high-quality vitamins and minerals. The Sports Series restores skin from cellular damage and stress. Astridian also offers a revitalizing solution for hair and a professional series for doctors and medical spas. Visit astridian.com today and begin your new journey to healthy, beautiful, youthful skin. Astridian, beyond your expectations. Are you ready for a new experience of freedom and powerful connection? Would you like a positive, effortless change in your life? Then come to CosmicFusion.com, where we offer the most advanced energy clearing and expansion techniques in the world with a quantum vortex energy to activate your divine blueprint and life's purpose. When your soul leads the way with Cosmic Fusion and Quantum Vortex Energy, you can break clear of past difficulties and blocks with the power of the Source. With Cosmic Fusion, the Source Energy does the work for you. It's easy and effortless. Listen to our free meditation right from our Cosmic Fusion website, The Cosmic Code Meditation. Sign up for one of our interactive webinars today. Come to Cosmic Fusion, www.kosmicfusion.com to experience an effortless awakening and transformation. 
Are you ready for an upgrade? Are you ready for a new experience of living in the fifth dimensional magic and powerful connection? Then visit CosmicFusion.com today. CosmicFusion.com Your property tax bill. Have you seen it lately? It's frightening. Your property taxes are going up while your home value is going down. It's time to fight back and win. For the real truth about the property tax system, get attorney Pat Quintilian's book, Are You Getting Screwed on Your Property Taxes? How to Find Out and How to Fix It. Attorney Quintilian answers all your questions and gives you the facts you need to fight a property tax bill that is spiraling out of control. You'll also read about what happens to property owners who don't check their property records, only to find out too late they're taxed on square footage, fixtures, and even buildings that they don't own. Is this happening to you? Learn your rights. Buy Attorney Pat Quintilian's book today. Are you getting screwed on your property taxes? How to find out and how to fix it. Available on Amazon.com. Welcome back, everyone, to Supernatural Girls Radio. I'm your host, Patricia Baker. I am here with my co-host, PK, and our terrific guest tonight, Laura Tempest Zakrov. She's the author of a new book called Weave the Liminal, Living Modern Traditional Witchcraft. So, Laura, let's talk about casting spells. You talk about it in your book, but... Our, our audience wants to know, well, how do you do this? And you talk about it as a formula. How does it work? Oh, spells. <laughs> but the, uh, the heart of everyone, like, how do I do this? Well, first, I think an understanding spells is to look at what is, what is magic, what is metaphysics, which and some people would define as the art of changing consciousness in accordance with will, to focus your intent to have an effect on the world. And I look at witchcraft as a form of weaving, that if we are all parts of a loom or a tapestry, then we we are threads, and our, we can affect the threads that we are interacting with and that are part of, whether that's other people or an environment. And so when we, we cast spells, there are many, many different kinds of spells out there. Most of the ones that people are familiar with are sympathetic magic, which means that there are correspondences that we believe affect the world around us. So if you burn a red candle and you see that red candle for love, you're like, oh, the color of red for love. Yes, I'll, you know, these things come together and I'll decorate with rose petals because rose petals mean love. Uh, that is essentially all these, these things, whether it's the herbs or the colors or stones, many of these things fascinate our right brain. And our right brain is where we visualize, Right. It's how we, mm-hmm. uh, you know, we we see the world. The left brain is very analytical and looking at the math and, and all the details where the right brain sees the leaves and then into the forest and then the whole picture. And it's often how we, we manifest things. It's also in control of a lot of the emotional things that we have. So when you sit down to, you know, write a spell out on a poem and on your, a piece of paper and, and set it on fire or you light that candle or you mix those herbs together and you drink a special tea, you are taking these elements together that help, you know, again, awaken that right brain and help you think about this is really what I want. This is what I'm focusing my will on. Um, the same thing with drawing sigils and magical properties. So what I, I recommend for folks is, you know, not to just like, oh, I'm going to, you know, get a book of spells and I'll just pull anything out of that. You really need to think about what is it that you want in the world because magic follows the path of least resistance, and that is not a new concept. Uh, that is something that if you go get back to that folklore I was mentioning earlier, and so many stories, you know, whether it's the, the three wishes from a genie or any of the Baba Yaga stories, is they be careful what you wish for because you might get it, and if you're not mm-hmm. if you're too specific or not specific enough, you might run into trouble, and. Uh, there's so many people who are like, oh, I, I cast my first spell, and then it worked too well. <laughs> and then they don't, they don't touch another, you know, try to do another spell for years and years after that uh, because it scared them so much. And that's, you know, I think it's taking the power out of yourself and realizing that we have so much power in our own lives to make changes. Uh, whether uh, you look at 
you know, when you encounter somebody, you know, in a cafe or walking down the street, and whether they smile at you or they look angry or whatever, you're picking up all these subliminal things, right? That's your right brain analyzing all of these things. And so when you come into your room and you're happy and it changes the mood for everybody else, there's, a, that's again, another wave. It's another vibration of the thread. So I think that's a really a healthier way to look at, at spellcraft is, you know, what, what are the changes I need? How do I affect them? And particularly, how do I make the necessary steps? And if it helps for you to light that candle so that you think about self-love and in that self-love you draw more love to you, if in doing a prosperity spell while you're rewriting your resume so you get a new job, you know, that helps you focus, these are all simple ways of doing magic. It is not, the power is not in the candle. Uh, the power, you know, it's not in all the objects though some of them have energies that help, it's in you. So that's where I, I really recommend people start is, is think about you and what do you really need and what do you want? What is the difference between need and want and actually what happens if you get it? <laughs> well, it makes sense uh, what you're saying. Point. Yeah, because, you know, when you're using these magical objects, you're actually, aren't you just using them to help you focus also in our world yes. of distractions? I mean, that candle, you look at that flame and you think about, you know, what I want is to remove the blocks on my path or whatever. So that, that candle can help you to focus your conscious and unconscious mind. Because as you're talking mm-hmm. about this, uh, I'm agreeing with you with the right brain and how and we're just going to use that term, even though they say it's outdated. But um, the right brain does respond to pictures, to images, uh, sound, light. So... We're giving that to the right brain and saying, this is what I'm focusing on. You need to keep your focus there, too. So it's interesting to, to see what can happen. But can you give us an idea of somebody you know? You don't have to tell us their name, but, but they cast a spell and it happened. And they went, oh, my God, I can't do this anymore. I'm scared to death. Can you give us an example of somebody who did that and what they were asking for? Oh, gosh, I feel like so many people have told me, um, you know, especially with love spells, uh, you know, some people who, who think, oh, this is, this is exactly what I want, you know, um, I want somebody who, who's, you know, looks like this and they're really passionate and, you know, and they kind of just stick on a few things instead of going, I also want somebody who's responsible and loyal and all the other, you know, the things are in a, a healthy relationship. Uh, and so then they found like, yeah, I, I got exactly what I wanted. I got, you know, this person that was, you know, six feet tall and had the Mediterranean features and very suave and so romantic and, you know, gave me everything I wanted. I thought I wanted out of romance, but also had six other partners that I didn't know about. Oh, <laughs> 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 You know, so, so things like well, things like that. Perfect. Like you, you, you really gotta, you really gotta think about. Yes, you know, especially when you're younger, you're like, oh, that's all I need, right? It just needs to be, you know, tall, dark, handsome, and good looking. That's all. That's all. That's all I need, right? <laughs> no, no. And a job, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, it is so much like the genie. I mean, because in every show on television and in film, they talk about that. I mean, they they show you how people screw themselves up with wishes mm-hmm. until the finally their last wish is oh my god just reverse everything i just asked for so it, yep. it just turns into a complete abject failure so it does make sense but isn't there aren't there ways around it like saying i would like love in my life you know but for the best of all concerned or can you give a blanket statement like that that keeps you out of these potholes yes and that's why you really want to put some some actual thought into it uh, and in crafting sigils, I, I tell folks to be like, okay, start with what is it that you want and then brainstorm what is it that you want so that you can get more um, specific or see where the loopholes or possible problems are. And so they're like, okay, I, you know, really what I'm looking for is in love that I'm looking for a partner who, you know, supports me, who has, you know, all these different things. And so you, you can just say, draw to me someone who has these qualities. And it, it might surprise you. It might not be what you think your idea, you know, is, but you'll have the right person in your life. Uh, so, 
you, it's, you same thing with like you know getting a house. It's, it's better to look to to work a spell that says I want something that's roughly in this neighborhood in this price range that has these qualities rather than going I want that specific house because maybe that specific house you think you want is really you know it's got a bad foundation or you know it's next to some really loud club or you know what are these other things you're not quite seeing because you're you're so caught up with the idea of it. Um, so yeah, you can pretty much put out to the universe and say, I would like this or better because the universe, you know, just as we give it a journal, you want to say God, spirits, or you know, the animistic view of the world and the spirit that is the, the world, the universe, is they can see the, the pattern better than we can. So if we are in the web and we're in the tapestry and we're weaving, we can see immediately around us. And maybe we can see a little further down the line. But someone with a slightly further out perspective can see problems even further or benefits and solutions. Uh, and it, you can even say that's part of ourselves that is, you know, connected to the divine. We're like, you know, stuck in the, the meat suits, right? <laughs> so it kind of right. dampens our, <laughs> how far we can see. But there's a part of us that is part of the divine in the universe. So maybe some part of us does see farther. So we're like, hey, part of me that's not all stuck up in the sexy hotness of this person or what I think will be, you know, really sexually satisfying or money monetarily satisfying for me. Help me pull in that thing that really will help my situation. And so appealing to that, it's not a saying to say, you know, you can call it a god, goddess, angels, any of these things. Uh, but you, you just want to say, there's part of myself that knows something better. And so I can appeal to that. So you can work that in as well. Um, so, yeah, it's just about finding that, that golden mean between, you know, really over-focusing and then just being like, oh, I just want love. And so you get covered in puppies. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes the puppies yeah. better. <laughs> no, I think so. I'm um, all for the puppies. So, <laughs> you know, here's, here's a couple questions coming in uh, from, from our listeners. And one is about protection spells, because in this day and age, mm -hmm. I'm hearing from a lot of women who are in urban areas, and they really don't feel safe. So... This question is about a protection spell. Like, is there a protection spell that people can learn to do to help them feel safer in their own environment? Mm, that's a really good question. There are several very easy things to do. Uh, one is if you have a very simple piece of jewelry, um, whether that you know something meaningful to you that you can wear every day. Um, whether that's something that's under your blouse, or a ring, or a bracelet, like with the evil eye bracelets, uh, something you can bless or consecrate to have protective energy. And so that you feel when you put that on every day that you think, this is something that is protecting me as I go out into the world. So you don't leave home without it. Uh, another thing to do is uh, using essential oils and drawing a little protective sigil on yourself or as you bless yourself. I, I love, you know, once I get ready for the day after taking a bath or a shower is I have a collection of oils and I select the oil for the day and I anoint my wrists and I, I smell that fragrance and I think about being present in my body, but it's also a layer of protection uh, for whatever spirit deity or concept might be connected to that oil. So if those things are, are imperceptible. You don't have to have, you know, a giant walking cross or a pinnacle on you. To, to be protected, right? It's more the the feeling that putting that thing on gives you a sense of putting on a layer of protection, putting that invisible oil on, right? Because once it's gone, you still might smell it during the day, but no one can see it. Um, unless you have allergies, then that's a bad idea. <laughs> right. Um, now, is there a particular oil, Laura, that you would recommend for protection? Uh, I, I, just, I really like the oils that... Uh, Black Phoenix, Black Phoenix Alchemy Lab puts out. Um, there are some really mm -hmm. witchy folks who put together a huge selection of oils, and all different kinds of themes, and they're they're really well mixed and using natural ingredients. Uh, and I like to collect them from in, in smaller people as well. Like when I go along and I find um, a maker at a, a craft fair who's got oils. So you can pick a specific scent um, that means something to you because the – the power, the oral factory nerves, the, the power of smell and memory, right? 
if you put on something that reminds you of your grandfather who always is there to protect you, that cologne is going to be more important than you than me telling you, oh, well, you should put some patchouli or ravine on you. You know, if you don't like that smell, it's not going to have that same effect as, oh, but you still have some of your grandfather's cologne. So Isn't that I interesting? That, wow. I like that. It's, it's a peace of mind. But if you like things like patchouli, patchouli amber, um, some people see that as being protective. Um, the particular oils that I like from um, Bee Pal, Black Phoenix, um, I love you know, Baba Yaga is a, a spirit goddess that I work with a lot. So I love the smell of that oil. And uh, a few of their other ones, they have Eclipse Series. I like, I like smoky kind of, um, oh, 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 I'm going to use the heavy air quotes that you can't see here, masculine scent. Uh, I, I like those a lot. Um, but then other people feel like roses are really protection. And if you see a roses are having thorns, right, they're beautiful, but yeah. then also mm-hmm. you, know, you pick them up. That's another way. So if you like the more floral scent, you, you don't have to say, like, there's not just one oil that's like, this is the only oil you can use for protection. It's that mm-hmm. mental effect that can really uh, impact and, and have a positive effect on your, your brain. And there are, you know, there are people who have all different, like, astrological mixes that, you know, you do it during this hour, and people who like the whole process of distilling it, that, too, is going to have an effect because you're involved in that process. So you can even, heck, if you're just like, olive oil, that's what grandma had <laughs> right there in the kitchen. Why not? Uh, yeah. You don't have to go out and spend anything else. I wouldn't recommend just plain old canola oil. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you talk about things having a personal meaning, and that's so important. We've had Lon Duquette, I'm sure you know Lon, on the show many, many times, and he says the same thing. He said, no matter what you do mm-hmm. with your work, it's got, you, if you want to work with objects, and then you must pick something that has meaning to you, because it's the only way it's going to work, is if it has meaning yep. to you. That's, that is it's the key. Actually, I got to meet Lon uh, mm-hmm. at Pantheon. So I guess it's almost two weeks ago now. So that's where we got to, to meet, and that's also where I lost my voice. So that's why I sound funny. Is that it's still, it's still a week and a half. You're still struggling. So, you're very happy, so it's okay. Yeah, it sounds good. Well, let's see. Now there's more questions coming in. Let me see if I can sort them out because they're all about casting spells. So talked mm-hmm. about protection spells. Now, of course, the next question, money spells. Tell us about money spells. All right. So money. <laughs> Everybody wants more money, right? Uh, Everybody. So uh, I think it's it's breaking down of looking at your financial situation. Uh, are you looking for a better job, right? Because so, money is, is many different things. It's it's the it's home equity, it is savings, it is spending money, it's being able to have extra perks, um, it's being able to cover your bills, uh, it's what brings money into your life. So there there are many different ways of looking at it. So I first recommend people going, okay, well, what do you mean by money? Because uh, sure, you can just say, okay, well, in the United States, money is somewhat green, and so you can take a green candle and anoint it with a money drawing oil. And you know, decorate it with some you know quarters and you know shiny things around it, and like I'm drawing money in. And you can do that during the waxing moon, which is from the first crescent all the way up to the full moon. And just imagine that you're drawing in money. But I like a little more practical approach that's more specific. So if it's coming down to that your current job is not paying you enough, and that you're up for a promotion, then I will put your energy into making sure that you get that promotion and the money that you're looking for. And that can be done with a sigil where you decide how much that money is and what those qualities are and what you need to have happen, which means maybe your supervisor needs to see you in a better light. I mean, your voice needs to be heard. Maybe you need to be more confident in your job. You just haven't felt comfortable enough. So finding out what is it that you need to tweak in order to get that result. So that's one way of looking at it. Uh, there, yeah. There's the herbal spells where you can, you know, say, planting the money tree. And for some people, that's different kinds. There's specific kind of bamboo. It's not all bamboo, but there's different kinds of money-drawing bamboo that's in, in Chinese culture, right? Uh, yeah. So some people say that growing that um, or using the little money frogs 
um, working with Ganesh, right, to, to remove obstacles, right? Say, okay, you're supposed to get this inheritance, but there's all this legal hang-up about things that are going on or paperwork was lost. And so you might work with Ganesh to say, all right, help remove these obstacles so that this can come through. And also what you're going to offer Ganesh on the other side of that as well. Uh, there's so many different ways of doing that. Um, so you can start simply with that little green candle or you can get down to specific and really think about yourself and what you need to do. Yeah, there's a lot of options here, which is nice. And you do have a book on sigil witchery that people can get to look for specific mm-hmm. sigils and how to use them. So I wanted to let everybody know about that. Now we have a a listener who's here who looks like they may have a question for you, and this is area code 216. So let's find out if they've got a question for you tonight. Hi, you're on the air. What's your name? Yes, hi. My name is Patricia calling from Cleveland, Ohio. Um, and I What's your called, question? Called, yeah, I called back. Um, I was just hearing from the last call, um, they must have asked about money, which I shall listen to the replay. Um, the, hmm, okay. Uh, been dealing with the I, dark night of the soul and coming out of a real difficult emotional psychic period. Um, mm. oh boy, um, and narcissism, uh, from a person, um, and I, it's just starting over again for me. Um, okay. what is the best, most effective way I've been, uh, looking at, I began to research, I guess, witchcraft is coming under paganism umbrella. And Mm -hmm. it's a centered religion, for lack of a better word. I uh, was researching that. Um, I I wasn't in my mind to become a witch. And, of course, we hear, you know, there are the stereotypes, and then there's, you know, what people have been writing and saying for years and years and years. Uh, But anyway, what is uh, for me just to clear out this past life karmic relationship with this man and who's a narcissist and just being so psychically attacked since I relocated back here, but I'm working on and will be relocating in spring or summer this year to the Pacific Northwest because uh, the energy here is just so, for me, uh, I believe it is in the city, just so harmful and toxic and negative. Mm. Well, well, you have some advice, oh, yeah. Patricia? Laura? Yes, Pat- all right, Patricia. Well, 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 when you get out to your the Pacific Northwest, welcome. And uh, currently here in Seattle, uh, so you got several different things going on. And what I recommend first is thinking about doing some cleansing to make sure that you feel like those ties are cut, that this person doesn't have a hold on you anymore. Uh, mm-hmm. And so that can be. You know, simply writing down these things or taking some artifacts or photos and burning them and letting them be scattered. Uh, you know, just feeling like, or you can even take, take that actually this way, say, I'd write up these things, your experiences of what you're letting go of, wrap it up with some thread, you know, thinking about I'm sealing this up and this is a thread that did attach us, uh, but now I'm going to set this on fire and release it. Uh, and let those ashes go, you know, leave them far away from your home. And then I can start work, working on healing as well as protecting yourself. And mm-hmm. the thing is when you're dealing with a narcissist is they, they are really good at abusing your soul, uh, your sense of self-worth, your emotional well-being. So mm-hmm. being, being kind to yourself and giving yourself a positive affirmation, I mean, it might seem light, but really, we often talk to ourselves in such negative ways that that's, we do a lot of harm to ourselves. So you got to start undoing that harm and saying, I'm worth it. Um, I can do amazing things, and I'm going to make changes happen. Uh, so you can do that with different crystals. You know, folks like to hold a crystal, um, you know, like a worry stone or something that you carry with you that you feel like you have. Uh, a reminder that you are on a new path and a new journey. And it could be something like hematite, which is grounding, but also some people see it as repelling negativity. 
and so it can be a stone of protection. Uh, quartz crystal, some people see that as cleansing. So see, I would recommend if you can go to, um, I think in your area there's a store called um, Goddess Elite. Um, I'm pretty sure it's in the, the Cleveland area. Um, and they have like an array of crystals and such. So I would say like, kind of go investigate and see what comes to you and and pick one or two of those up and start carrying them with you. You can set up an altar as well. If you have a little altar or shrine, it doesn't have to be to a god or a goddess. It can just be to yourself as well as what you're bringing into your life. So you would see where you want to come here in the Pacific Northwest and put a picture of that or put a little map or the book of that and start putting together those elements that you're seeing coming into your future. So it's, a, it's going to be a lot of work, but it's a lot of little things that you can do on a daily or weekly basis. You just kind of check in with yourself and just heal yourself. All right. Does that help, Patricia? Thanks. I think that's some good advice. Yeah. Yes, yes. Now she'll listen to the replay. Oh, yes, yes. And we're going to keep That's keep good. sharing things here that may help you. So keep listening. And thank you so much for your call. Thank you, thank you Patricia. Good luck. You know these narcissists. There seem to be a lot more of them out there today. And narcissism, my God. I, you know, I was a therapist. I used to say narcissists were the most dangerous people to be in a relationship with. They're so mm-hmm. invasive and tough, and they get in on so many different levels. Don't you find that, Laura? Yes, and I, I think it's it's not that there's more of them, but I think it's more that we're finally identifying it instead of people just ignoring and saying, oh, they're just an angry person, or, oh, well, they have had these issues. Like, there are so many you know, decades and decades of, you know, oh, that's just how they are, and you just have to deal with it. <laughs> You know? Yeah, exactly. And so well, wait, good. This is not healthy behavior. Yeah, no, no it isn't. And and the <laughs> only way to deal with with them is to get away from them in, a, in a, an intimate relationship like that. They become super dangerous. So, I uh, Patricia, you have our best wishes and many blessings to heal that and have a much better life with a better person for you. So, okay, so let's say we talked about money. What about love? What about drawing love in? And you mentioned a red candle, rose petals, things like that. And also that not to fixate so much on one person, but maybe to ask whoever's best for me on my path or something more general like that. Is that the best way to go? Yeah. Um, hmm. So love, it's a complicated thing, as we know. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I, and I used to re I used to do psychic readings professionally. I don't I don't do it anymore because I just don't have the time and um, as other things I focus on. But I swear every other reading would be about love and somebody being in a relationship of, uh, you know, oh, he says he's going to leave his wife for me. When's he going to do that? And oh, yeah. you know, right. <laughs> all of, it's like oh, honey, you know, he's getting he's getting all he wants. Nothing's going to change. That's <laughs> you know? right. So you they always forget it. If, if they'll, yeah, if they cheat on you, they're going to cheat on you. If they, yeah, they cheat with you, they'll cheat cheat on you. That's absolutely yeah. true. Yeah, yeah, sure. Those behaviors don't change, and you'd be blind to things too. So I, I tend to when people come at me with with wanting to love things, I'm like, well, first you've got to really love yourself. Because if you are putting yourself on hold for somebody else who isn't giving you the time and love and energy that you deserve, then you aren't loving yourself. Uh, and you know, other people say, "Well, no, you know, the problem isn't just that; you have to be loved." And but no, it really does start with with just giving yourself at least the opening to say, "I deserve love, and I want to find that within myself." And in that process, and that thing, nobody has to be nobody's perfect. And nobody gets to a spot where, oh, I'm instantly healed, and so now I'm ready for love. I mean, this is not this is not really how the universe works. It's, everything is constantly in transformation and changing and growing. So it's simply a matter of opening the door to say first, I deserve love, and giving yourself that energy to be open to love is a fabulous start. And then once you are in a healthier state, then you start prioritizing what is really important and you can draw those qualities to you in another person. 
there's also ways you can do love spells with somebody who you're like, okay, we are in a partnership, we're in this relationship, and we want to continue to strengthen it. And so there are um, different kinds of love spells that you can do where you're working together and you say, well, we're either going to grow together or we're going to figure out this isn't going to work, uh, which is always better than just being like I'm trying to snare somebody. You just never want to. <laughs> yeah. And, <laughs> or not. <laughs> yeah, you don't want to yeah. compel somebody like a vampire would to uh, to love you because that's always going to backfire, right? Yeah, and eventually you're going to wonder, like, well, maybe they don't really love me, and, that, and it's, just, it's just taking a hold for yourself. And, uh, you know, again, drawing something to you that you don't necessarily want. So I, instead of being like, I want this specific person, then you think, well, what, what about this person or the idea of this person is exciting to you that, that makes you really feel good about your life? And sometimes, you know, not everything is about being in a relationship. You just might want to have awesome True. sex. And so I would say, okay, then I want to be able to have these things for a certain amount of time, and I want to make sure that it's safe sex and that, um, you know, it's still a healthy relationship. And so you can pull those things. It's like, what are you looking for? Are you going to be in, you know, a polyamorous situation? And well, does that mean you're, you need to be a better communicator? Because, well, just within two people, you need really good communication, and most people suck at that. So if you're going to have three or four people in there, you really got to be good at communicating and understanding your feelings and talking with each other. So that could be more about a communication and emotional well-being spell than it is about love. Right, right. Now here's an interesting question for you. Somebody wants to know, can you use spells to solve crime? Hmm. To solve a crime? Well, I wonder if they really mean to solve a crime or to ex- to get vengeance or uh, to bring in justice. Uh, uh, well, to find out, maybe, there. you know, the, yeah, it could be any of the above because there are a lot of crimes that certainly go unsolved, a lot of murders that go unsolved. Um, mm-hmm. And can you use spells to address these things to find the truth? Yes. Uh, so let's say you're dealing with a, an, an unsolved crime and you want to be able to have more energy put into it or reveal something, then you might work on um, a revelation spell uh, or something that also is like you know that the particular detective or agency that's working with it doesn't have enough people or time. Then that you give them extra resources, right, helping to lend resources. Uh, for some people, it's working with spirits and being like, okay, well, this happened in this place. I know that these people or these entities also reside in this place. So you might do something to help get information or push clues for that would help reveal that. So a spell can be done like that. Uh, and then on the other side, like say the, the more justice, you can just do a spell for justice. You can be doing with something where um, you want that, you know, like say, vengeance, justice, balance, equality, whatever it is you're looking for, the, the right result comes through. Um, there, there are saints, there are deities that you can work with, particularly to bring justice in. Uh, even in the idea, idea of justice. I'm going back to, to money. There's, you know, Fortuna is a goddess in herself. So if you don't feel, you know, feel connected to some deity, you can also go into that archetype concept. So you can mm-hmm. appeal to justice. You can have that um, picture of justice blind and say, you know, please let this, you know, the right outcome come through. Uh, or whatever your desired outcome, you got to be cautious about that. I would tend to put the universe the the right outcome. <laughs> that well, that's that interesting. Uh, I'll tell you, you know, this brings to mind a few years back we did a show on the Oklahoma Girl Scout murders, which some of you may mm-hmm. remember. It happened many years ago. Oh, yeah. There's a horrible crime. And the person who they suspected, who allegedly did this, was Native American. And I was really surprised to learn how many Native Americans were involved with witchcraft. And mm-hmm. the person who allegedly did this uh, actually uh, was tried and was let go. And he had been doing all these spells all along. But at the end of the day, he was in prison for another crime that he was caught and convicted for. So he was serving mm-hmm. a sentence. He was a young man, and there was a Native American uh, shaman who did a spell. 
And the spell was that the person who committed this heinous crime to these poor three little girls would die. Mm -hmm. And this man who was accused of the crime but got off was jogging around the, uh, I guess they had a little outdoor area for the prisoners. And all of a sudden, he dropped dead of a heart attack. Mm. So that was the end of this horrible story. But it, it was interesting how much this man used witchcraft to kind of shield himself. And yet at the end of the day, it was another person, a shaman, who uh, called forth enough energy to identify the person who did it and then make him pay. So it, it was a fascinating story. It was so tragic, but it you know it did give you a good feeling at the end. <laughs> the person <laughs> was wiped out, you know, for what they did. But um, I was so curious to to learn more about this in terms of Native Americans having this big connection with witchcraft. So it's it's not just a European thing, a white person thing. That they were very involved with it and still are. It, it really comes down to the the words, right? So most English speaking folks we use we use witchcraft, we use magic, we you know, these are the terms we use. But working those threads, deal connecting with spirits, the other world, uh, working our own human powers, you know, I think every culture has a name for it and every culture has a means of doing it. Uh, they might you know, it might be really hidden and it might be underground. But the more a culture is connected to the land, connected to the spirits, and still has the hasn't let go of that sense of personal power, gut, and intuition, and that these things actually work, the, you know, the more effective it is. You know, we especially for for most folks who are coming from European descent, we've kind of had that, you know beaten out and unless you go to the Slavic regions where they're really just a generation back they're like nope we're still pretty pagan we're still doing all these (laughs) we're still doing all the stuff you you can put a church over there but you know we're still making some sacrifices over here uh right you know there it's that there's these layers of separation but whether you are in south america or you're in australia or you're in india anywhere you go you will find that there is some method or means even if it's been hidden really well of using metaphysics, of connecting those threads and trying to work them in some way. And I think that's part of the human psyche. Uh, so it, it is prevalent. It's just what is the word that we, they use to call it? And the, the word I feel more comfortable with is, is calling it witchcraft. Uh, but um, mainly, you know, result of a, a bunch of sort of English New Jersey accent. <laughs> right. Well, in the book you talk, which is great again, the name of the book is Weave the Liminal, everybody. It's excellent. Now, when you talk in the book about being um, a born into witchcraft, being born a witch and being a made witch, what's the difference? Tell us about that. So the I think it's really started evolving. Um, this actually goes back a long time, this idea of being born into magic or born into witchcraft. Uh, the idea of being a natural witch, right? Um, and so some people say, I just came into it. Well, some people just don't have the, uh, the, the all those barriers that are set up within society or how they were raised, uh, the things that haven't shut down. I When you talk to children, right, young children, who talk about their invisible friends or that they could see grandma even though grandma's passed away, um, and that they can see, you know, a, this cat that's in the house, but you don't have a cat. You know, young children are open to seeing things because we haven't shut down their imagination, what we're calling it for lack of a better word. And so I think all human beings have the potential to be in touch with the more magical side. And some are just been able to kind of slide through without being shut down in so many ways. So, mm-hmm. That's my opinion, but some people just want to say, oh, I was born a witch, so therefore, you know, I've got this all down. <laughs> like, oh, you still have to yeah. learn some things along the way. <laughs> um, and then the technically being made a witch, uh, an initiation, and initiations come in many forms. That's through dedication. You begin initiated into a certain tradition. So if you wanted to be a Gardnerian Wiccan, 
uh, you would have to find a gardenerian coven. You'd have to study and be initiated into that group to call yourself gardenerian or Alexandrian or the temple of witchcraft or whatever tradition it is. So if you're going to follow a particular practice that is a specific tradition, you have to kind of be initiated into that tradition. Uh, even if you're born, like say your parents are both Gardner and Wiccans, you're still, you're still in a process. Much like when you're Catholic, you have your confirmation, right? You have to learn your things mm-hmm. about the faith. Same with Judaism, right? To have a bar mitzvah or a bat mitzvah. To become an adult in your religion, you have yeah. to study. You have to know the catechism. Right. Uh, so all of these things come at some point where you really do formatively and cognitively recognize where are you on your path? If you have some psychic intuitions, that doesn't necessarily mean you're a, you know, a witch. It means you've got some psychic intuitions and that perhaps you probably can develop that ability more. And if you so wish, maybe you do feel comfortable with that label and you feel that's part of your identity and so that can come to that. So that's the way I look at it. Uh, one is not better than the other. They're just different approaches to almost the same person. Yeah, now, are there still people around, still witches around, where it's been passed down from generation to generation to generation, so somebody could still be in this world today, like a seventh generation witch? Because I think in a lot of cultures, we have got so mishmash here, we've lost a lot of the oral traditions, and they haven't been passed down like they used to be. But are there still seventh generation witches and things like that? Uh I would I wouldn't I wouldn't say absolutely not. I, I think it's possible and especially in more indigenous groups, uh like Kulandero, uh, you know, that might be something that's been passed down for a few generations that hasn't been burnt out by the church. Uh so that's a and with that, First isn't that isn't curandero? Is it? It's more specific, isn't it, to the Spanish culture? Yeah. So that's a, a type of heal a healer, though. You know, with popular culture right now, you might hear bruja, which is you know kind of the same equivalent of witch, right? That it's sort of in your face. Um, that right. it has a negative connotation to it, but they're reclaiming the power of it. Uh, but you know, do you hear people are like, "Oh my, you know." Great, 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 great aunt supposedly was a witch in Salem, and it's like, yeah, maybe. <laughs> you know, <laughs> there's, there's there's a lot of stuff going on there. It could be. Um, I do think that you tend to have certain perspectives that might be passed on if you want to look at mitochondrial DNA, right? That if, if things you know different, there's there's genetic imprints, there's emotional. Uh, Emotional trauma, but also emotional gifts. Uh, it's like, you know, all these things that can be passed along within the DNA. Is they're, they're starting mm-hmm. to do studies on that. So maybe you do come from a line of people where it's been, you know, maybe grandma hit it, but great grandma didn't. And you might be the next one who's starting to pick up on those things and you find out that this was a thing that went down your family. And it is also entirely possible that even if you don't have someone alive to teach you those things, that you can receive information from ancestors or spirits. Uh, I, I look at the universe as sort of that there's no information that's ever truly lost. Anything that we're supposed to know has a great potential to come back again. It might take us a little while to figure it out, but there, there are many, um, especially Mediterranean and Slavic traditions, where it's believed that if your great-grandma or your grandma couldn't teach you the thing, they might come back in your dreams and still teach you the thing, and you will wake up with this herbal recipe that you have no idea where it came from, but it works and it makes sense. Oh, cool. So, you know, that it can happen through that. There's, there's many days, ways of looking at it. But there's a lot of, in the current kind of pagan community, there's a bit of eye-rolling where you are you know, like, oh, grandma was a witch or great-grandma was a witch, because there were a whole lot of people who wanted to make themselves be legitimate um, and it was no, you know, grandma had already passed, so there was no way to, to pull anything, you know, proof from it, right? Just to, because they wanted to seem more authentic. And mm-hmm. that's, you know, that's where it comes back to that insecurity thing. It's like, you know, grandma was probably a good Catholic. Maybe she taught you a thing or two about bells. I mean, if you, if you told <laughs> my, if my grandma, you know, was a witch, she'd be like, uh, you know, tell me to go to my room, also call me heathen. But you know, kind of a funny thing <laughs> is um, uh, Mary Grace uh, Furrer has a book out on Italian soap magic, 
which felt so much like my family that I sent a copy to my mom, and my mom says, oh, my God, I remember, you know, great aunt, blah, 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 still in the name, doing that and doing this thing. And I was like, yes, I remember these things, too, when I was little when I saw it. You know, and so here's these things where these, these folklore traditions and these practices of witchcraft and, and you know, healing against the evil eye and curing, you know, all these things, it's still there. Yeah, now, you know, it's so funny you mentioned that, the evil eye. I, I mean, I used to hear that from, from my mother mm-hmm. about you need to protect it from the evil eye. Okay, how do you protect it? What is the evil eye, number one? And then how do you protect yourself from it, number two? <laughs> <laughs> so... The easiest way to to define the evil eye, uh, it tends to be a unintended glance, right? An unintended look that causes detrimental effects. Like, and it could be caused by jealousy. Um, it could be praising somebody and then drawing the attention of the spirits to that person. Um, and generally, it also tends to be about issues of wealth, fertility, prosperity. Uh, you know, um, one of my teachers called it all the fluids, right? So much things mm-hmm. with the evil eye have to do with um, preserving manhood and uh, and fertility of females and of the cows and, and you know of the fields and all of these things. So it's sort of it's a sort of often unintentional condition that gets passed on through want, jealousy, uh, and so that the the wording gets the evil eye whether it's the, the little um, glass eyes that you see or tassels or the, the uh, mano figo or mano cornuto, which are the different hand gestures, or the, the coral where you have the Italian horn. For example, I met brothers had Italian horns. You know, and what does oh, yeah. that Italian horn look like, right? <laughs> like yeah. a little sperm or a little penis. You know, if that's what they're there for. They're kind of to protect the manhood, right, to protect the virility. Uh, and so they deflect that eye uh, so that you, it's, the eye is met with another eye, that the spirits are confused and so that they don't go, oh, somebody's having luck and prosperity, let's screw with that. Uh, so it can be passed on by people unintentionally, but uh, I think there's plenty of cases, too, where it's put on intentionally. So you can, you can argue with many a grandmom and aunt about that one. <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting. I mean, it's it's a term that I've heard for so long, and you explained it very well. So thank you for mm-hmm. that. I mean, there's so many ways to go as a contemporary witch, as a modern witch in the world. And I think your book is extremely helpful for anybody who's interested in this kind of thing. Now, is it really important at this point, if somebody's interested in witchcraft, to find a coven or is it equally okay to just study on the, on your own? I recommend starting to study on your own so you get a sense of what what it is that you want. Uh, I do talk about looking at covens. I don't actually think that covens are the most natural uh, organization for witches. Uh, I love working with other witches, but it's sort of where I like to call it convening, that we can come from our different paths and uh, – do a ritual together or do a, a spell craft together uh, and just basically share our experiences. So being able to communicate, talk, and share your experiences with like-minded people is really important, I think. But it doesn't mean you have to join a coven to do that. Uh, so okay. I, I really caution, uh, caution, but I recommend that folks start to look. And what the, I started to mention about earlier with rights, uh, they give you a really simple system to look at your roots. Uh, your inspiration, considering your time, which is your schedule and how you look at the year, your lunar and solar year, to look at your environment and to lastly look at what your, your what I call your star, your guiding principles. And once you figure that out, then it's easier for you to find out if, if you really want to work with a group of other people and be initiated in tradition to find a tradition that has similar views uh, on ritual, magic, spellcraft, you know, traditions, all these things coming together, uh, rather than kind of blindly reaching out and be like, oh, look, it's a coven, I think I'll join it. Uh, mm-hmm. So, yeah, you know, I, I recommend finding yourself first, and and then, it's you know, it's totally cool, we'll check out and study, uh, and most covens, if they're really valid, will 
be able to say, like, well, here's our open course so you can see what we're about uh, so that you can find out are these people, you know, a, a group that you feel you can work with? Do you like those folks? Um, or does it feel uncomfortable? If you're someone who's outside the gender binary and it's a very heteronormative priest, priestess kind of thing, then you might not find that very comfortable. And there are plenty of traditions out there that break the gender binary um, that are open to all kinds of sexualities uh, you know, and many different traditions of backgrounds. And so there's, there's a wealth of things out there, but I really recommend for people to start first. What is it that you're looking for, and what is it that you really want before you go running to join a coven? Okay. Well, that's good advice. And now you offer classes yourself? I teach workshops. Uh, so I do. Uh, I travel the country. I do festivals, and when I do book tours, I offer workshops wherever I'm at. At the moment, I'm kind of too busy uh, either traveling or working on projects to offer classes online. But eventually, I'm going to get to that. Uh, there's a online group called the House of Twigs that I've signed up with. Um, that eventually, at some point, maybe in the fall, I'll start doing classes online there as well. Oh, that's terrific! And you also do readings, yes. For people, uh, I don't do tarot readings anymore for folks. Um, at least not in a professional sense. Um, so I don't do that. Um, I will do occasionally. I'll design sigils for folks, and I do artwork, like devotional artwork for people, and different kinds of spells, um, spellcraft that's done through painting. So that's kind of where what I'm mainly offering when I have time. Uh, though we're probably not opening that back up until the summer because we're we're about to do some big changes here on at the home front. So like, well, <laughs> till I get settled again, so you're back from the UK. Oh. <laughs> oh my! So you are overwhelmed, but you know, as an artist, and you're really a good artist as well. I've seen some of your artwork; it's beautiful. If somebody wanted to, for you to design your their own personal sigil, you'd be able to do that for them when you have time. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So if they go to um, if you go to my website, which is lauratempest.craft.com, it'll get you to all the other websites. I have like six, seven, eight websites, so um, oh kind of easier to go to the mother site and then go out from there. <laughs> wow, that's a lot of websites. Yes, and again, that the website you're sending people to now is Laura L A U R A Tempest T E M P E S T. Zakroff, Z-A-K-R-O-F-F dot com. And your book is available on Amazon, right? And yes. so people can get it there. Or I'm sure some of the bookstores around town are also carrying it. And again, the name of the book is called Weave the Liminal, Living Modern Traditional Witchcraft. It's a wealth of information that you put into this book. I, I mean, honestly, Laura, it's great. And we're so happy to always have you back on the show because it's so much fun talking to you about all of these things. And we always learn so much from you. We think we've got it down, Aww. but not really. And we always have more to learn <laughs> when you come on this show. And yes. you've been doing this for so long. Now, what about, I'm going to ask you real quickly, uh, dark witchcraft. And that what I'm talking about is not asking for something nicely for yourself, but doing something to get vengeance. What's your feeling about that? So when it comes to, I, I don't look at magic as being black or white. Uh, it's really a matter of what are you willing to take responsibility for? And ah, good answer. If you, yeah. yeah it, it's, you know, a lot of people think that they'll feel better if they hurt somebody because they will hurt themselves. And that just causes a cycle. Uh, I am all for, Justice. I'm all for stopping rapists and um, bigots and people who are, you know, up to doing trouble. I'm not, and I often say, just stop them, right? Have the universe do what it is to stop them from hurting other people. I don't tell the, you know, put the universe and say, oh, please do this. <laughs> yeah, know, exactly. Act. Right. Well, that makes sense. So, so, Laura, thank you. Thank you so much for coming on the show with us again, everybody. The name of the book is Weave the Liminal. And, Laura, we can't wait to have you back again. Thank you so Thank much. You. And we'll be back next week, everybody, with another show. We've got Graham Phillips and the Green Stone. He is our own Indiana Jones. He's going to be joining us next week. Until then, 
Galaxy on the Blue Highway. Good night, everyone. Good night. Goodbye. Thanks for listening. Tune in next week for another radio adventure with Supernatural.